This is smithy.tv. Hey, I'm Pat Mastriani, and guess what? I'm here with my old friend, Dio Aday. Yes, sir. Yes, Dude, sir. how you been, brother? Good, man. Good yeah, it's good to see you. Welcome back to Toronto. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dio and I uh, bumped into each other a couple of years ago uh, during a casting session. You were uh, at uh, Casting Central for one uh, audition, uh, audition, and I was uh, there for another. We yeah. weren't obviously auditioning for the same part. Even though um, we both, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it had been almost 20 years since you and I had yeah. talked, and and not really for any reason. Just you were doing your thing uh, in yeah. LA, and I was doing my thing here in Toronto, uh, and our paths just didn't cross. So yeah. it was it was just a really nice moment to catch up with you, and and you had told me that you were back in Toronto to uh, talk to Linda Schuyler, the producer of Degrassi, for her new series, LA Confidential. LA Complex. Complex. I'm, yes. I apologize. LA yeah. Complex, which you you did. A season of that with her two seasons two seasons yeah. it lasted that long yeah. okay <laughs> <laughs> see epitome pictures and linda schuyler they they she has this kind of curse where degrassi she can produce degrassi for Forever. 100 years right Forever. but any other concept or show that she tries to get out there usually only lasts one or two seasons, seasons. for whatever reason she's yeah. just got to stick with what she's good at yeah. and that's degrassi yeah. so uh and then uh, you and i bumped into each other again last year on the set of cracked mm -hmm. which was another series that you both Look, you yes. son of a bitch, you're just doing <laughs> really, really well these last few years, but I'm so happy for you. Right, um, right. You were the lead on, on a series that was uh, produced by the CBC called Cracked, and yeah. uh, you got to play a, a really cool character. Yeah. Uh, uh, Leo Beckett, uh, he was a psychiatric nurse. Yeah. So it was actually, it was it, I was over the moon playing this character because, you know, with my stature and build, a lot of the times I'm getting the heavy or I'm getting the bad guy or the villain. Mm -hmm. And um, to finally get to play something that's very opposite to what... LA or America has been trying to typecast me into, but those four walls are too big for that, anyways. Um, no, it was nice to finally come home and then get and then get the opportunity to play something much lighter, a very empathetic character, and just to really show my range as far as that, like you know, I can play these softer characters who um, who come from the heart. And um, cracked, it's been an amazing journey. Unfortunately, we just found out with all the CBC budget cuts and everything, there won't be a third season. Mm -hmm. But uh, the impact that we left on the on the mental um, health um, world and institution, we've really left a really great marker and helping them educate other people right. about mem uh, about mental illness. Yeah, no, I, I I really enjoyed my small little appearance on the show oh, with you. We, we, I was actually talking to them about bringing you back we, for season three. That would have been fun, man. We had a blast, and it was just surreal because uh, again, you and I hadn't been on set together in over twenty years, and it was like not a day had passed. Yeah, I know. And uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely uh, make sure Ryan gets a fun picture that we took that yeah. day to, to show. <laughs> insert now. Um, but I want to talk to you also about the early days, Dial, because okay. if I'm remembering correctly, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm sure I am, but you were one of the few actors back in the 80s that were on Degrassi that had representation, that had an agent. Yes. Y you were like one of the real actors on the show. <laughs> well, I thought you guys were the real actors, because I, I was a newbie. I was a newbie. He came in, I like it wasn't, uh, first there was Kids of Degrassi Street, then there was Degrassi Junior High, and yeah. I came in at the tail end. Uh, pretty much the last season of, of junior, junior high, high and right. then I did all of uh, Degrassi high right um, I came in with an agent but I was very green as far as how the industry worked mm -hmm. um, I pretty in, I pretty much entrusted everything as far as what happened behind the scenes paperwork contracts all that stuff to my agent mm -hmm. and um, you know I just started off by modeling but I was one of those kids I can never sit down mm -hmm. or be still long enough to for a camera to capture me you blended in with us really really well Dal. I mean we enjoyed every moment we had with you on set I mean, you were the clown you were the goofy one you're the one making the jokes and the pranks and you know you were just like you'd been there forever and um, this is fun man it, I got to hang out with my peers and you guys were already on TV I was like oh shit this is cool I get to just hang out with these dudes and yeah dude it was a lot of great memories I, I often tell people when they say what was it like being on set it, I go you know it's kind of like summer camp but it also felt like we were going through a war together and yeah. some of us came through the other side and, yeah. and are, are still around today to tell the tale because uh, unfortunately out of the cast of 50 or so that we had of the original cast of Degrassi maybe a five five of us are still around it's less than five from our generation yeah 
you know, there's you, me, Celux, Stefan Brogren, uh, uh, Darren Brown, Darren Brown you know, six, yeah, a few so. a few people here yeah. and there. And, and you know, what that just happens, you know. We, we oh, Andy Chambers is behind the camera. Okay. I ran into him. He actually, uh, he was uh, one of our guest cameramen mm -hmm. for uh, season two of Cracked. It was really, really cool to see him. That must be fun to have yeah. old friends come on board, but board. they're working behind the cameras yeah. now. And they've they've been established for, for years and years, like Darren Brown, who's uh, who played Dwayne on, on the old series. Yeah. He's, he's very well established in the community. Um, but yeah, I mean, the fact that you stuck it out, but you took a totally different route than I did, you actually made that step to LA. You actually made that commitment to going down. And what year did you make that decision? I went in 98. Oh, 98? 98. Okay. It was ending of 97. First, I went in 97, took a whole lot of stuff with me. Yeah. Came back fe uh, February, January or early February mm -hmm. of 98. Got the rest of my stuff and boom, it was officially, officially there. See, I tried that in, in 95 after I finished my second series, which was called Liberty Street. And I, I said that. to myself, I have two choices. I can either go to university or I can go to L.A. And, yeah. and I made the choice to go to L.A. because I felt that I had to get it out of my system. You know, every actor in Canada, you get to a certain level. And yeah. it's like, okay, I guess I'm supposed to go to L.A. now. And they don't really, you don't understand until you're there that all of a sudden you're this tiny, tiny little fish in this yeah. giant, giant river of talent and people that, that are trying to do the exact same, same thing. thing. You become a molecule. Yeah, you've just you become a small little small you are. grain of, of dirt yeah. in a giant city. <laughs> and, uh, you know, no ill will because, I mean, the four years I spent there, I learned a lot. And I, and I, I do consider those my university years. I learned a lot. I grew as a person. I grew as an actor. I, I, I learned what I really needed to do to become a, an actor and to, to, to make this an industry. But you had a completely different level of commitment that I was so impressed with because when you talked to me last year about what you went through. Oh, God. That just blew my mind. Uh, I, I couldn't do that, and I, and I couldn't even come close. But maybe you'll tell me a little bit on camera about what you had to go through um, to survive. You know what? It was it, very much like yourself. Degrassi had really put us on a platform. Mm -hmm. it, had given, it, it had given us an opportunity to really be able you know, to be exposed to the world and see that our world, especially in the entertainment business, is so much bigger than Toronto. Yeah. Toronto was a great stepping stone. But first, I went to New York. I, I lived there for about maybe about a year and a half between there and New Jersey. It wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. Came back, um, and then I was still doing you know guest appearance spots on different shows. And then, I, but I was barbering at the same time. And a really good friend of mine who owned the barber shop was going to California to go visit his mom. Mm -hmm. So he just like you know invited me to come along, and it was literally that one trip that changed my whole perspective on. Um, just our whole film industry. Mm -hmm. I literally got off the plane, and this was after um, the 1995 or 96 earthquakes, I think it was, mm -hmm. in Northridge. I showed up after that, and it was, I got off the plane, and just breathing in the air, right away, I knew this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> did not see Hollywood Boulevard, did not see Sunset, did not see Venice, didn't see none of that. We went straight to the valley. Mm -hmm. And in that short week and a half vacation, that was when I knew I was like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. And then, you know, just to, you know, fast forward to 98, you know, one late 97, early 98, I was making the transition. And um, when I got there, I literally made the mistake that a lot of actors make. Mm -hmm. You just pack all your stuff, you take what money you have, you yeah. show up, and then you're like, now what? Oh shit, now <laughs> what am I gonna do? You know what I mean? And it was literally, it rocked my world because yeah. I I went there with the attitude six months to a year I'll be on another series I'll be doing good again mm -hmm. and LA literally it chewed me up but it couldn't spit me out I refused to let it spit me out mm -hmm. I stuck it out I was homeless for a while um, you said you lived in your car I lived in I lived in the park you lived in I didn't the park. even have a car at that time holy cow I was it was in a YMCA over at uh, yeah, you don't even but then you, you you were you were bouncing for a while. At bouncing some around for a while. Um, well, that actually came later. Okay. Um, so I, then I finally, you know, got a grasp on everything, and I said, okay, first thing I need to do is I need to get a job mm -hmm. so that I can put a roof over my head mm -hmm. and then start working towards a car. Yeah. Those are pretty much the, the three main essential things you have to be able to do is you have to be able to provide like find a job mm -hmm. so you can live, yeah. put a roof over your head so you can sleep. And then get transportation because, like you know, if you don't have transportation in LA, you cannot rely on on the public transit system. Um, so you know, then I met this African family who just happened to be from the same country I'm from. I was coming from the park that I was happened to be staying at at the time. 
was walking by and you know I got tattoos so I had my cut off and the husband was outside and you know there he was talking to his Nigerian friends and they're speaking in my mother tongue and they didn't realize I was Nigerian so as I'm walking by I slowed down and I'm kind of looking at them so we started talking trash about me so I walked by I stopped turn around I said excuse me Shamo, we pray. I'm a Yoruba to me. No, so I started speaking to him in our own dialect. He was like, him and his friends just kind of looked at me like, oh. Uh, and, and we pretty much hit it off from there. Cool. He introduced me to his wife. They, like, you know, uh, ended up you know, trying to find out where I was living. I tried to dodge that bullet. Mm-hmm. It wasn't successful. They found out. And they pretty much, like, I bartered my way and said, look, well, they offered, like, you know, we're going to try to find you a place to stay. They couldn't find me a place to stay. So then they took me in. And I worked my way, like, picking up their kids from school, yeah. helping them with their homework. I cleaned around the house. I mowed the lawn. So I did all the little odds and end jobs so that they could do what they needed to do. And I was like a live-in nanny, almost wow. like, you know what I mean? Yeah. All the way out in Northridge. <sighs> After about seven, eight months of that, um, you know, I was getting to the point of where, like, you know, I wanted to get my own place. So, and I was like, okay, I gotta get a job. So there was this company called Survival Insurance. Picked up the phone to call and just talk about like, you know, trying to get a job. And what's, was this is the craziest thing, and this is how I know God is good. The guy who picked up the phone on the other line was an actor from Ohio. He had just started, um, no, 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 I got the job at Survival Insurance and yeah, so I called Survival Insurance. I got the job, started working there. So I was commuting back and forth from Northridge all the way to Hollywood. I think it was after my training sessions. It was my first week actually answering phones. I wasn't doing jack, dude. I was just <laughs> calling friends in Canada long distance. Everything was like all good. I saw my manager coming and it's a free for all. When the phone rings, first agent to pick it up gets, yeah. gets the client. So I saw my manager coming. Phone wasn't even ringing. I just picked it up, pretending like I started talking to somebody. There's this other guy on the line. This other guy, his name is Todd. I'm not going to mention last names. But um, ends up being an actor from Ohio. He's looking for car insurance. We started talking about everything under the sun except insurance. <laughs> we hit it off. He told me his roommate was moving back to Ohio. So he's looking for a roommate. Yeah. I said, that's funny. I'm actually looking for a place to move to. Long story short, this guy ends up being my roommate for like the next six, seven years. We are now best of friends. He came to my wedding. I sorry, Todd, I missed your wedding. Oh. Um, his younger brother is we're born on the same day. He's yeah. like my little white mini me. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and it's like and they literally they they took me into their family. I remember there was one Christmas. Um, I was just in L.A. Didn't have nothing to do. His parents flew me out to Ohio, bought me presents, put it under the tree. Like they're literally like my second that. family. So, like, my struggles and, and, and my whole journey in L.A. has been a growth spurt for me. Right. It really taught me a lot about people, how you have to really protect yourself. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes doing things the wrong way will strengthen you as an individual in life but in general. You also had a bit of a, a spiritual journey, too, because, I mean, you met some very generous people that stepped up and took care of you when you were in a place that could have literally destroyed you. Yeah. And you just were lucky. And like you said, you know there's a God because these people came out of nowhere to help you out yeah. in your time of need. need. And then at some point, things must have turned for you because... I'll tell a quick story real yeah. right now where I'm sitting at a Golden Griddle in Toronto with my wife on a Sunday morning and I'm watching, you know, you have TVs while you're eating your breakfast at uh-huh. the Golden Griddle and I'm looking and there's this Pamela Anderson TV series <laughs> and I see a, a Mr. <laughs> Bulked Up Dio a Day playing a wrestler and I go I go to my wife I go, hon, that's, that's Dio, that's Dio on this Pamela Anderson, what was that show called? VIP. VIP, I'm like... Son of a bitch, you got a gig on VIPs working with Pamela Anderson. Oh. And then and then I see him on um, Lost, which was my favorite show at the time. I'm like, damn it, he's on Lost. And then ER, and then CSI, and then uh, Star Trek Enterprise. I'm like, dude, you blew up at some point. Something happened to you where things just started to happen for you slowly. I'm sure it happened over many years. Yeah. But the opportunities started to happen for you. And So what was that like and how did that change you? It was after finally getting a place like with my roommate. We're both struggling actors moving forward towards that dream. Then it was all about now I had figured out what I needed to do. Mm-hmm. So it was get a job. Got it, so I got a yeah. job. Ended up leaving Survivor. Got a job at um, Enterprise, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the car rental place. Yep. So we, so myself and my roommate. So after I got the job, I got him a job there. 
and we utilized it as a way to learn our way around LA because mm-hmm. we were drivers dropping off cars to different branches. Yep. So we l- literally learned LA. That was number one. Had a job income coming in. Then I was working a second job as um, as a doorman at the Standard Hotel. Yeah. So I was working two jobs. Then I ended up getting a third job. So I was just rack saving money because I needed to get that car. Yeah. And um, I literally, after about two and a half, almost three years, mm-hmm. yeah, because it was early 2000 when the Pam Anderson, the, yeah. the VIP book, and after I got that was when I went into SAG, you know, f- finished all my paperwork. Mm-hmm. But um, that was when I was like, okay, you know what? I need to really buckle down, get myself a really good agent, because mm-hmm. the agent I had at the time was just like a miss, 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 miss with the one hit. Yeah. And so then I started sending out headshots, got into an acting class, and then I met my agent that I presently have now, mm-hmm. and... It was pretty much after that, it was just one show after another. And I literally had to go all, not back to the bottom, and I don't want to call it the bottom of the barrel, but almost doing, I didn't do extras, but I went back to Mm co-stars. Built a co-star resume enough that people were like, okay, because you know when you walk into a a casting session, they already know who we are, because a lot of the casting directors are our same age and generation, so Mm -hmm. they, and Darazi was huge in the States. So they knew who I was, but the first question was always, what have you done since you've been here? Yeah, where have you been? And I'm like, uh, you know, I'm working on that now. So yeah. I went back to co-stars. Then eventually I got to a point where I told my agent, and I said, you know what? I'll do the auditions, but when I book them, I'm not doing them anymore. Mm-hmm. It's time to go to the guest stars. Mm-hmm. So I consciously made that choice. Mm-hmm. Let them know that's what we're doing. We did it. And then we made that transition to guest stars. You're, you're incredibly l- lucky in the sense that, you know, you have this, this physical side of you that yeah. that's very uh strong and overpowering you're tall and i guess a lot of people don't expect you to be a really good actor too right <laughs> they, they a lot of you know beautiful actresses and a lot of the big strong guys that's all they've got going for them. they don't yeah. have this wealth of of experience on a set to back up and and to be able to give those kind of performances so when you uh, for example like you said crack gave you an opportunity to be a more sensitive type of character yeah. uh something that that people weren't expecting you get to you get that opportunity to blow them away Right. And I think when you are in a casting session, people are like genuinely impressed and surprised, especially if they, if they don't know your history. They're yeah. like, where did this guy come from? Like, he's yeah. an overnight star. No, I'm not an overnight right. star. It took me 25 years <laughs> to get to this here. spot, right? Yeah. But now you're, you're even more motivated to go to the next level because you and I are now talking about what's going to happen for you in the next five to ten years. Yeah. You're, you're ready to go to the next level, no. which is uh, the production end yeah, of things. producing now, yeah. Um, you know what it is, Pat, is... Literally, I think just being raised as a Canadian, like, you know, I'm West African by birth. Mm -hmm. I was born in Nigeria. Um, My parents, we traveled from there to London, England, to Calgary, Alberta, back to Nigeria, to London, England, and then ended up in Toronto. And it was... It, it was the work ethic of watching my parents have always been hard workers. Yep. So that ethic, and I know you come, I know your same parents are the same, yeah. same way. Mm-hmm. And that's why we clicked when we met on the set. Yeah. And then to have the opportunity to do what we did and then being Canadians, we're raised to be so humble, mm-hmm. which is a blessing, but it's also a curse. True. Which I'll get to that later on because mm-hmm. I think in this industry now, Humility can be more of a curse than a blessing, especially when you're in, in competition with Hollywood mm-hmm. and there's Bollywood. Mm-hmm. Now there's Nollywood. There are all these other countries who are jumping on that entertainment bandwagon who yeah. are coming in with a lot of money. And us as Canadians, and you know, David Sutcliffe from Cracked said this the best is that Canadians, with like in a general, like in a whole, we are okay with just being recognized Mm -hmm. when you think of the american mentality it's gold or nothing Mm -hmm. and being in la for like almost 17 years now i've come back with that mentality Mm -hmm. it's either i'm first second place silver it doesn't that that doesn't mean nothing it just means i gotta go back to the drawing board work that much harder and come back again Mm -hmm. i i have to and refuse to lose i need to be in first place well it's like the picture that you have on your twitter account behind your headshot you have a giant key Key. gold key and it says success Success. on it and you know what there's nothing wrong with being that motivated you have to be because like you said there is so much competition i definitely agree that uh, with that mentality because i know some of my personal faults is that sometimes i'm too humble i'm too shy i'm too 
quiet on a set. I'm not aggressive. But you know, you get me in a character, you get me in my wardrobe, and uh, I'll blow you away. Yeah, because you, when you came on set that day, dude, trust me, they were talking. They're like, "Yo." He's but that's that's the thing. I always knew that I'd be a great supporting actor, a great character uh, actor. That I would be there to to support the celebs, the stars of a series or, or or a feature film. And that's where I sort of focus my my strengths at. Like years ago, years ago, Yan and Catherine, Yan Moore, our head writer on Degrassi, and Catherine Ellis, his wife, who was the publicist for the the show, they said to me, Pat. Get it out of your head that you're going to be a, a Mel Gibson or a Tom Cruise. See, or, or, but you know what? That's yeah. okay, though. But listen, I knew what I could do. I knew that I was a short, little, skinny guy that had this opportunity to be the lead of a television series. And I knew I couldn't ride that way for my entire career. I knew that I was going to have to take a step back and go, okay, I won't always be a star. I won't always be the leading character. But I have to be humble enough and modest enough to say, hey, I can be a supporting character. See, but I don't agree with that. But that's okay. We have two different points of view. But let me tell you why I don't agree with that. <laughs> And, and and I hope you hear me really clearly. I hear you. Okay. It's just like you said, young actor, you were riding the wave of being a star. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else planted a seed, and I love Yan, mm -hmm. and I love I love them both. But our destinies are, are our own to create. Right. And like you said, you were riding the wave of being a star. But when you look at that analogy, surfers, they paddle out, mm -hmm. they catch the wave, yep. every wave comes to an end. Right. But surfers always get back on their board and they go back out and they catch another wave. True. The choice is yours. Don't let somebody else tell you what wave you can ride. But that's true. But there's, also... there's enough waves for everybody. I understand there's the definitely enough waves for everyone. makes us all feel like yeah. molecules. It's a big ocean out there. Man. But there are those that are good at riding waves and those that are not so good at riding waves. And the point right. being, my point being is that I would rather ride the smaller waves for a longer period of time okay. and try to catch that giant wave that I may never catch. Right? I have to be realistic as well in terms of what I can offer as a character mm -hmm. uh, to a production company, to a director, a producer, whatever. Um, you know, I know that I've been living off of a very nice wave of Degrassi uh, notoriety for 20 years and a lot of the people that hire me, they grew up watching me on TV and it maybe motivated them to get into the industry. So it's like, Pat, I grew up watching you. I'd love to work with you. Okay. And here's a really awesome role that I think you'd enjoy doing. So I've been doing a lot of independent features. I've been doing a lot of smaller projects because you know what? Those are the kind of people that I want to work with. They're letting me play with the characters. They're allowing me the opportunity yeah. to develop something that's unique for me and that I enjoy creating okay. where you know you get to walk onto a set for just maybe a couple of days and you get to play a guest role those pay the bills yeah it's very rare that you get a really juicy See, part yeah where you sink your teeth into, into it and you're like proud of that you know yeah. product that you you you're, you had a part in making so you know what if if that means that it takes me a little longer to get back on that big wave again mm -hmm. so be it because i'm here for the long ride Okay. I'm not here. I'm not one of those guys. What's that saying? That the candle that burns twice as bright only lasts half as half long. As long. Yeah. Thank you. Like I want to be that guy who's still around in his fifties and sixties doing it. Yeah. And 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 if that means that I'm not going to be a star every single year that I, I'm in this industry and may have good years, bad years, I'm, I'm I'm okay with that, right? Okay. Um. But again, I I know that I have to be realistic, and I know that in Canada, it's a it's still a tough game to be in. LA is crazy. That's a whole yeah, other animal. Yeah, and yeah. same with New York. But Toronto and Vancouver, Montreal, we've got a nice little thing going here in Canada. And yeah. I, again, I, I chose to come back and be a big fish in a small pond. And uh, you know, I hope that with all my friends that are doing well and they're going to succeed and they're going to move up the chain and become producers and mm -hmm. themselves, they're going to remember the guy that was there with them in the beginning. Right from you the trenches, I mean? baby. And, and these are the ways that we move forward in our careers, just supporting each other. And I told you about that when we met last year. Yeah. You know, I stay close to people that I trust. And there's just always people that are ready to ride your coattails, but I have a very small select group of friends, and I think you are the same way, that you try to keep the always close friends tight. tight. And, and those are the ones that you want to invest your energy and time into. Yeah. Um, you know, Because we live in a fickle industry, uh, people come and go all the time, but it's the, the close friends that stick with you through the Do highs and, and the lows, lows right? Yeah. So, um, you know, what dial, I really appreciate you coming in, and, and I you, do wish man. you the best, brother. Thank you, brother. Um, remember <laughs> me when you become a big shot producer. And uh, you know what, Dio and I are going to be in Niagara Falls uh, June 6th to the 8th for a, a big comic convention that happens there. I've been enjoying myself these last few months yeah. appearing at these comic conventions, and I told Dio he's got to come and join me for this one. So if you're in Niagara Falls, come check
check us out. Come say hi. Get an autographed picture or a picture taken with us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you there. Thanks again. And, uh, you know what, Dio? I often get people asking me uh, advice on acting and how to get into acting and what's yeah. the best way to, to get into the industry, uh, either in Toronto or, or in L.A. Um, what do you think about that and what advice can you offer people? It's funny you should uh, ask that. And I'm actually really happy you asked about that. Um, you know, every actor's journey or every individual's journey in life no two journeys are ever the same, especially with us being entertainers. Um, my journey was very different from yours, as has been from, from a lot of other actors. And um, I've created, and I'm in the process of creating a course called Right Way to LA. Um, this is pretty much essentially for actors right now, and it's gonna grow, um, where we wanna bring 15 to 20 actors, mainly from Toronto, bring them down to LA. They're going to be um, meeting producers, directors, casting directors, um, their hotel accommodations will be included, their flights will be included, food will be included, transportation will be included. Um, while during the entire seven to nine day period that they're there, they're also going to be um, in an acting class with an, an LA acting teacher just so that they can see the difference of things that are expected yeah. between the Canadian and the American market. Right. Um, so this is my way of kind of giving back and trying to help other people figure out you know, if it is the right time for them to go to LA right. and that there is a right way of getting to LA. Mm -hmm. It's never the same for any two people, right. but there are certain parameters that you should definitely hit mm -hmm. before you pack your bags mm -hmm. and just go. Well, so it sounds like you're paying it forward, basically. The people that are you know less knowledgeable about the industry, the, almost like where you were at 20 years ago when you were yeah. living you know, uh, in the park, you know, you don't yeah. want people to have to suffer the same, same way you did. Exactly. Um, it would make a great reality series as well. If you <laughs> thought about, you know, actually video videotaping it. Um, I would probably sign up for it myself. I could definitely use the right way to LA guidance. So uh, I, I wish you the best with that. That sounds like a great idea. I wish that was Thank around you. for us, or for me. You that's know, but you that's know. really one of the main reasons why I want to do this is because if I had had the knowledge that I have now, if some if I'd had somebody just to help guide me, yeah. I wouldn't have made as many mistakes and taken as long. I wouldn't. It wouldn't have taken as long to get to where I am now, yeah. and I wouldn't have spent as much money. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. And those are three critical things that you need to really have a really good grasp on, yeah. especially when you're making that transition. Because I take my hat off to anybody who leaves where they're originally from and relocates. Yeah. It takes a certain kind of individual with a certain kind of spirit to do that yeah. already, and then to be chasing that dream in the entertainment field. Yeah. It's crazy. You know. It is yeah. so crazy. You know. But you know what? For me, I'm happy that I got it out of my system. I didn't want to be 50, 60 years old and say to myself, I wonder what it would have been like. Yeah. I wonder if I just tried. What could so I'm really happy that I had my experience. And like you said, my journey is different than your journey. I love where I'm at right now. You know, I have a, a wonderful life here in Toronto with a wonderful wife and a home and friends and family. And, and this is where I belong. I know I belong here. So there's no regrets whatsoever. And, yeah, and I, I hope that you never have any regrets. It doesn't sound like you do. You yeah. you are on the path that you want to be on. I'm a warrior, and, and bro. I'm just getting started, man. I'm still buckling through them, man. And even through all that craziness that you had experienced over the last few years, you still had time to meet a beautiful woman, I know, get married. Way, yeah. Aren't you a lucky SOB? <laughs> um, you know, and, and uh, hey, you know what? Continued success, my Thank friend. You, I hope you reach all the goals you want. Thank you, man. All right. All right. You know what, before we go, I do want to mention one last thing. If you haven't had a chance to download the smithy.tv app, it's available on iTunes. You just type in smithy.tv and you can download that onto your phone or your tablet and then you can from there uh, go to your favorite show, your favorite host. You can get updates, you can find out what's going to be uh, coming to you, uh, behind the scenes photos. There's a ton of stuff that the app does. Uh, you can be notified when uh, new episodes appear and uh, check it out. I think you'll like it. It's a free app and it's available on iTunes.